We've just finished a journey, dear friends, or at least part of a journey. How many can remember back where you were on Thanksgiving Day? Do you remember what you ate on Thanksgiving Day? Well, I remember that my son took me to the Honey Baked Ham store, and we bought one of those turkey roasts in Chicago. It was kind of a crisp, cold night. I think it was 23 degrees, snow flurries. We go to Chicago every Thanksgiving. Uh, we have to go up there to visit Linda's granddaughters. And that, my wife, Linda, she's the lady right here, in case you want to know. Anyway, uh, and uh, it, as a serendipity, we get to visit with my son and his wife. And his wife is a wonderful girl. Kelly, I love her to death. Paul did really good. Or God did good in bringing her into his life. But whatever. And, but Kelly is not only a type A. I can talk about her a little bit because she's not here. She's a triple A. And from the day, the minute we get to their house in Palatine, that's northwest of downtown Chicago, about 45 minutes, she's got everything planned. Right down, click, 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 click. And so we had Thanksgiving dinner. And on Friday... What was Friday? Friday? Oh, Friday's Black Friday. Anybody remember Black Friday? Did you sit out there in, a, in, a, in the cold of the morning, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, waiting for a story? Anybody do that? Sit out to get an iPad or iPod or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we went to Woodfield Mall, uh, which is one of, which is huge. I mean, they got six of these big box stores. Uh, Nordstrom's and Macy's and Penny's and Sears, all these places as part of this same mall. And I've always liked to go to malls at Christmas time because they always do such a great job decorating and you, you get a real spirit of Christmas and it's all wonderful. Woodfield is huge because it's three floors and a basement. All these stores. And we went in off the, out of the parking lot into Macy's. Walked right into the men's department. It looked like, this was at 8 o'clock on Good Friday night. Now think about this. Black Friday night. Uh, not Good Friday, Black. Uh, it looked like they'd run a herd of feral hogs through that department. So help me. The, the, over there where you go to the checkout, they had a stack of clothes on the hangers, and some of them weren't on the hangers. I couldn't even reach the top of it, and I'm six foot four. And the uh, right, hangers on the floor, and they, uh, hey, it was terrible. Anyway, I, I, it, was, it, was, it was not a good experience. And, uh, but that's part of the journey. Everything was strewn about. Now, Joseph and Mary have been on a journey. And Corey did a beautiful job during Christmas, during Advent. I, I'm sure you believe it, agree with me on this. You know, telling us about the various Mary and Joseph and, and, and Elizabeth and the innkeeper. Had them all come up here and talk to us. And it was really great. They got to Bethlehem to be counted. They made that long journey from Nazareth. We don't know really how they came, whether they came down the Jordan or through the hills or whatever. It doesn't make a difference. They got there. And time came for her to, be, to deliver a child. Jesus was born, put in a manger. But now, the manger's empty. There's just a cow or goat, sheep, donkey, whatever, there in the stable. Not much left. Maybe straw strewn around on the ground. Maybe there's part of the swaddling clothes that they wrapped the baby in laying there on the ground. Don't know. But they're not there. They moved on. Did you ever... You know, when I was a kid, 
That's back before the days of these sacks, you know, and all the tissue you stick down the top of them, you know. You take the t tissues. I started bringing a sack today with a bunch of tissue and throw it out like this, you know. But when I was a kid, everybody, every packages were wrapped with big bowls, and all this kind of stuff. And you paid $5 extra down to the department store to get that special package wrapped. Uh, I did a deal with Linda one time when we were first married. She needed one to watch for Christmas. And I had this box about like that. And it weighed real heavy because I had bought a $1.19 cake plate and put it inside. And she shook that thing, and it was that little box with that watch in it. And finally, she got down to where the, she thought she saw that cake plate. It was on top of the watch. And countenance kind of dropped. She almost threw the box away. I said, hey, look a little further. Anyway, you know how, how he, you throw the paper around, the boxes all over the, uh, the den floor, the living room floor, whatever, wherever the Christmas tree is. And uh, uh, we had a grip with those like, plastic bags. We'd start stacking the, the paper and the boxes and the stuff in so we wouldn't lose anything. Anybody ever throw something away at Christmas time? Get carried away with the trash? That's terrible. But anyway, that's kind of where it is today. You know, I, last week I heard a, a country western song, first time. Uh, New Kid in Town. You, anybody hear that song? I want to hear it again. It's a country western song about a new kid in town. And the town is called Bethlehem. New Kid in Town. So what? Jesus was born. A new boy was born. What? So what? What difference did it make? That's the question today. Listen, over in Luke, we're going to have the first or second verse. Luke 25, 35. Let's read that. You got your Bibles with you? And behold, there was a man. There you go. <laughs> There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, that is the Messiah. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not, be, not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, which was eight days he was to be circumcised, they took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou, thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared for the face of all the people, and a light to lighten all the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which had been spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. The next text is the story where Mary and Joseph go with a lot of their friends and relatives up to Jerusalem at Passover, as was their custom. And Jesus is with them, and they do their thing for about two or three days, and all of a sudden they decide it's time to go home. And so they leave, and about a day's journey down the road, Mary and Joseph, assuming that Jesus was in the crowd with them, because everybody was friends and family, wasn't even worry about it. And they can't find him. And they go back to Jerusalem, and look for three days looking for him. And finally they find him over in the temple talking with the scribes and the elders of the And they say, what do you mean? We've been worried about you. We've been looking for you. And he says, hey, didn't you know? Why were you worried? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? You know, they had done, they had gone back to doing what was customary, what was normal, what was regular in their lives. 
After Jesus is born, what do they do? They go back to Nazareth. Joseph continues to be a carpenter. They continue to follow Jewish ritual and Jewish law because they're going to Passover as regularly as their custom in Jerusalem. Mary is busy taking care of kids and raising kids, keeping a house. Jesus is born. So what? Folks, that's what the world says. The world says, hey, does it make any difference? A baby was born in Jerusalem, I mean, in Bethlehem. It doesn't make any difference, does it? Really? So what? Empty stall, empty manger. Shepherds have gone back to the fields, tending their flocks. Oh, yeah, their hearts were warmed. They praised God for all that wonderful thing that happened to them. But now they were back out in the cold, taking care of their flocks. Innkeeper, he was cleaning up after the all the crowds had left. And now, and now, what do we do? We've come to a journey of Advent. We've lit the candles. We were here on Christmas Eve. Marvelous experience. I stood up here at 5 o'clock. And I was choked up when the lights went up, the candles went up, and this place just was illuminated. You couldn't see it from out there, but you could see it from up here. I, I, I never fail to get, but what I get choked up on that kind of experience. It's like the presence and the warmth of God has come and, and is intimately here present with us. It's all happened. We celebrated with loved ones the Christmas experience. We've opened countless cards, I guess, and gifts and, and had shared all the goodies. By the way, I didn't gain any weight over Christmas. Did you? It's been a good time. So, 2013 is day after tomorrow sometime. What's he going to bring? Who are we going to be as a church? As individuals? That's the question for today. And you know, Paul has um, written over in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. That's what this today is about. Because he starts with chapter, verse 12 and he says, therefore, and every time Paul comes up with therefore, brethren, hey, it's time, it's time to get on the stick and listen. Therefore, since you are justified by faith, Romans 5, 1. Therefore, therefore, listen. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Paul goes back to, to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 8 to remind us that you and I are God's elect. We are God's chosen. We are God's adopted people. We were no people before we were chosen and elected by God. I don't care whether we're three years old or 80 years old or whatever we are. We are God's holy, beloved, elected people. And that places a responsibility on us. We're not just ordinary folk. We have a responsibility. And he, he, he doesn't wait. He starts right in and gives us five things that we're responsible for. Listen, he says, we have put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And if you want to add something to that, go over to Galatians 5, 
22 and 23, and you can read all the gifts of the Spirit. Those wouldn't hurt to have that as well. Because the last one in that list over in Galatians is self-control. And I, I have kind of problem with that sometimes when the referees don't make a very good call on a football game. But, uh, anyway, uh, and he begins by saying, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, verse 13. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. What's the church about? We don't live in a very forgiving world, do we? The courts are full of people that don't know how to forgive. Suing one another. Bringing cases against one another. Relationships have been destroyed in families. Longtime school friends have separated themselves because they couldn't forgive one another for something that was done or they thought was done. The church is that one place, dear friends, where the forgiving presence of God is a reality or it is supposed to be a reality. That's one of the reasons Linda and I come to Argyle Church. It's because we feel that here, that we are beginning, that we have the, 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 we have the beginning vestiges of God's forgiving presence among us. Because, hey, is there anybody here without sin? Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't know anybody that's not included in that. We all fall short once in a while. We all get upset once in a while. We all have ought against each other, one, other people from time to time. It's difficult sometimes to forgive people. We might not forget, but we're called to forgive. Forgive. That's the essence of our relationships. If you really, really want to be in relationship with someone, you need to be able to be who you are. Knowing that if you foul up, if you get askew a little bit in the relationship, that there is a forgiveness there. There is an embrace. There's something that is shared and known that life is not at an end. Relationships are not destroyed. Forgiveness, as we have been forgiven by God, oh, we pray that every Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. Forgiveness is the basis of what the church is. And that feeds almost immediately in <clears throat> End of verse 14, he said, But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Dear friends, love is the superglue of relationships. Last verse in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, I'll show you still a better way. And he goes into chapter 13 and talks about all of what love is. And love, down in the middle of that chapter, says, Love is. Love never ends. The love of God for you and for me never ends. Read in Romans 8, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Not even somebody slapping you up beside the face. Not even somebody embarrassing you. Not even somebody doing something that you have no, no regard for at all. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And it's that kind of love, dear friends, that makes the church what it is, if it is the church. It is that love that accepts and forgives, enables, 
and has compassion on each other that binds us together in unity. God forgives us, and we're able to forgive one another. God loves us, and we're able to love one another. Steps one and steps two. Step three leads us to chapter, verse 15, and when he says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were all, you were also you were called in one body and be thankful. Dear friends, we are the church. We love each other, we forgive each other, and we come together in peace and joy and thanksgiving. We are one unified in that gracious presence that the, our good Jewish friends call shalom, peace. It's more than just an icing on the cake. It is something that permeates the whole totality of who we are. Shalom. Peace of knowing that we are loved. The peace of knowing that we are forgiven. The peace of knowing that we can be one regardless of our diversity. That's the reason I'm a Methodist. The Methodist church has a spectrum wider than I can reach for us where we are theologically and sociologically and all anything else. Economically, whatever. But we are one in Christ Jesus. You know, when we were, we had the joy of building a new church over in Flower Mound. And people would come to our church, our worship services, and they were Roman Catholic, and they were Baptist, and they were Presbyterian, and they were Church of Christ, and they were Episcopalians, and they were Congregationalists, and whatever else. I'd go knock on their door, and we'd sit down and talk. And I'd ask them the question that Wesley asked people. Do you love Jesus Christ? Is he, do you have him in your heart? Are you satisfied with your relationship with Jesus? And if they said yes, I said, give me your hand. We can have fellowship together. We'll find out what Methodists believe later on. And by the way, if you've not been to Methodism 101, uh, you need to go. It's a pretty good course. And if you need, don't really are not happy with your understanding of the Bible, you need to enroll in disciple Bible study. It won't hurt you a bit, and you will learn a bunch. You see, we are one in Christ because he forgave us on the cross. He bought our lives, our salvation, paid for our, the price of our sins, and he loves us ultimately. He will not leave us alone. And he brings peace to our lives. Shalom. Maybe I can understand it, explain it this way. Have you ever seen somebody been in a room with somebody just about that time that God's calling them home? I've been in some places where it's been a very bad situation. Tough. Tough, tough. I've also been in a situation where, hey, there was joy, there was peace, there was calmness, there was hope. And they just went home to God. Oh, what a joy! One day we'll all be there with him, perhaps, experiencing that same joy. That's shalom. Shalom is that experience where in very difficult times and the seas of life are way over the decks of the ship called the church. And in the midst of that, calmness comes. And life goes on. Maybe you've been, this year's been a tough year. 
Maybe you've had some tough experiences. I don't know what they are. But you've been able to move through them. You don't know how, but you did. That's shalom. That's the peace of God stabilizing all that you are. Riding the ship, calming the waves for the ship called the church. And what do we do as a result of that? Letting the peace of God rule in our hearts. Well, we let the word of Christ dwell in our hearts. And it's richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, I know that we didn't sing any 7-Eleven songs in here this morning. Excuse me, that's praise. I, I, you know what? That's my colloquialism for being an old man talking about these new praise songs. I'm sorry, 7-Eleven songs. Uh, and, and I like some of them. I'm really... In fact, I was asked last Sunday if I wouldn't come singing, singing with the group on Sunday uh, at 9.15. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's not uh, Bach or Palestrina or, or Handel or something like that. Anyway, uh, that's neither there. But how do we sing? You know, Wesley had a, rule, a long list of rules about how people are supposed to sing. And down in the middle of it, he said, he, he says, sing lustily. Uh, Leor tries, is a wife of... Methodist preacher, she and her husband both are dead and gone home. One of these days of fellowship with them, I guess, but I hope. But uh, Leora, she's a little lady about this tall, just about right there. And uh, she sat on third row back on the left side over at Walnut Hill Church. Walnut Hill is a pretty good sized church. And you could hear Leora. Now, she wasn't in singing in pitch on tune. She couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. A bucket. But, boy, she was singing lustily. So the next time you get up to sing a song, I don't care whether you can sing alto, bass, soprano, whatever, whether you can sing in tune or not. You have the words. Sing lustily. Praise God that you can put one foot in front of another. Praise God that you got uh, something to eat every day. Praise God that you got uh, friends that love you. Praise God that you were born in this great land. Thanksgiving and praise for all that God has done for you. Given you the parents, the children, this church. Praise God for Argyle Church. You don't know. Hey, you have no idea how lucky you are to be a part of this church. It's a great church. Marvelous fellowship. That's why Lynn and I are here. You know how hard it is for one Methodist preacher to go listen to another Methodist preacher preach? I love to hear Corey preach. I love to hear Anastasia play the piano. Man, she can get all over that keyboard. You know, hey, it's, I love to fellowship with you because I know that, hey, you love me. You forgive me. And together we share in the peace of God's shalom here in this place. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. But what's all this for? We could have all of that and the world would still say, well, gee whiz, so what? So Tell me about it. Well, we got an empty stall. All the packages have been unwrapped. We got a year that's in the books. We're looking for a new one. So, is this year any different than last? You see, dear friend, we are called to be that presence in the world. I said at first service, we are called to be that beachhead in the world. And I, I was asked after church, what was a beachhead? And I said, well, a beachhead is a place where when you're invading a country, when you're we're entering in a country, you go in and set up a base of operations so that 
you can move out and be in that land. That's what we're called to be. Hey, the world out there where we live is not a very nice place. It's tough. People will get all over your case in a New York minute. And they don't like us sometimes. And who knows what the new year is going to bring. Do know this, that if it's going to change, it's going to be up to us. And what did it say in the beginning? We, as the elect, holy, and beloved of God. Who's going to be the elect, beloved, and holy of God if it's not you and me? And how do we live? How do we react? How does the world see us? Oh, really? Y'all go, you know, so? We can drive right on by. It don't make any difference. It does make a difference about who we are as we relate to one another, as we forgive one another, as we are in love with one another. That makes a difference because the world begins to see that things are different here. That things are different in your family. That things are different the way you relate to your children. That things are different the way you relate to your employees or your fellow employees. That things are different because, hey, you've been forgiven and you let it show. You've been loved and you let it show. And you have the peace of God in your heart, and you let it show. That's being a beachhead in the world. That's being a presence in the world. And so as we look at 2013, as we make a resolution, as we give thought to what we will be next week, next month, or this time next year, and we come to this time next year, and we ask ourselves again, what difference did it make? The stall will still be empty. What will we have done with the forgiving, loving, peaceful presence of God in our lives? over these next days and months in our homes, in our families, in our church? That's the question, dear friends. How will you answer it? Will the answer be, well, it wasn't a very good year. Will the answer be, well, it was, oh, it was all right. You know, we got through it. We're still able to get up and take nourishment. Or will we be able to say it was a great year? Because back in May, I had, I had the opportunity to share with somebody about what God was doing in my life. Or in August, when it was hot and and, and, and everything wasn't going right. We were able to, to, to survive and, and get on and be the power, the positive presence of God in that moment when life was going to hell in a handbasket. We were still able to hold our heads high. Or in December, come back and elevate a candle again and a candlelight service so that the light, the precious light of God's love still shines so that others might see. Because you see, there's no darkness that can put it out as long as you let it shine in your heart. There's forgiveness, 
with love and with the peace of God. And it's my prayer for you, dear friends, that these three will bind your hearts, your families, and our church together in these coming days. Amen and amen.